All right, so uh, last talk of the day. Thank you for still sticking around. It's, it's, it's been a long day. Um, so a lot of you got exposed to Go uh, yesterday for the first time. Um, a lot of you still are quite new to Go, and you're sort of learning and sort of being around other Gophers who've been doing this for a little while. So you, you're picking up some tips and you're picking up sort of the right way to think about Go and and um, sort of take some of that back with you. All right. Um, we've seen talks on sort of uh, introducing you to Go and sort of the idiomatic way of, of doing Go. And you've also seen talks on testing, you've also seen how Go is used for uh, web development and, and some really cool data science stuff. Now I'm going to talk to you about a problem that is not, well, that is universal. Not specific to Go, it is universal, but we're going to tie it, tie it into Go because this affects us all. So, what is, your, what is the nature of your relationship with code in general? So, the fact that you are here, all right, it, I can sort of tell that you, you like coding, right? Otherwise, you would be here, you would, you would be doing it as a profession, right? Um, To some degree, you, you love coding, right, for the most part. But if I were to ask every single one of you this question sort of individually, so get some stories from you, those stories would be as diverse as the projects you work on. But for the most part, most of us would sort of echo the same trend. When a project starts, everybody is sort of happy and, and this is sort of new territory, green feel, you know, you get to try some new things. Uh, you know, some of the stuff Bill was talking about running around up and down and saying, hey, concurrency, you know, you get to try some of that stuff. You get excited, it's, it's cool, it's fun, right? And then you ship some code the first time, a few iterations, you start, you know, you feel good, right? You're shipping code that the business wants. And then feedback starts to come in, the, the, maybe the customer actually wants some features to be developed and, and they want to fix some bugs and, and, and things start to come in, so they start messing around with your mojo a little bit. They start messing around with the, your, your, your nice architecture or, or uh, um, the things that you're proud of, right? And then as time goes on, it becomes a bit more difficult. It becomes a little harder and harder to work on that code base, if you're not, at least if you're, if you're moving fast and breaking things. And then at some point, you stop moving fast and breaking things and shit's just broke. <laughs> so we all sort of have seen this pattern play out over and over and over again. And we in the Go community are not immune to that. Right? Of course, I'm talking about technical debt. And a lot of you, once I started showing this progression, you naturally, so your mind just went there. You're like, yeah, technical debt. That's probably one of, if not the most influential factor in how we feel about code, the nature of our relationship with the code that we work on. So I'm gonna take you on a brief journey over the next few minutes, a brief intellectual journey, to help you and I understand the nature of our relationship with code. And yes, the role that technical debt plays in enriching or impoverishing that relationship. We'll talk about what our code already knows about us. We'll talk about technical debt and how when managed is actually a good thing. It allows you to ship faster. We'll talk about what tools and techniques can help us understand our technical debt. And so that's how it's solved. And we'll talk about how this all ties into Go, where Go comes in, where Go fits into this, and how Go, the Go community, can actually move this forward. Hello. <laughs> My name is Johnny Borsico, a software developer, journeyman, quite like yourselves. I've been in a relationship with code for just about as long as I have in a relationship with my life partner of 18 years. Now, in talking to my wife about this fact, I may have uttered something along the lines of my being able to predict certain behavior patterns of code after, after having worked with them for 18 plus years, making sure to contrast this 
proud realization with my inability to predict some of her behavior patterns sometimes <laughs> after 18 plus years. Well, what happened next was somewhat predictable. Or <laughs> I've had some time to reassess my position on this, <laughs> mainly from the doghouse. And I am now convinced that her unpredictability is a feature, not a bug. <laughs> so, what does our code know about us? Well, if you're like most developers today, um, you use a version control system. And if you're not, come talk to me. <laughs> really, I want to know how you get through your day. So, we have a built-in scribe, a chronicler, recording everything we do with our code. And naturally, I'm talking about you know, the, the, the VCS tools that we use, be it Git, SVN, I'm not sure if we'll still, still use that, but it qualifies. Um, there's something from Microsoft, I don't know, I don't, not in that world. Um, but every time you choose to expose a snapshot of your code right, to that DCS in the form of a commit, you're, and some of you are already picking up on that Easter egg there, um, every time you choose to expose a snapshot of your code to the DCS, a substantial amount of metadata is also captured, not simply the stuff you're changing. So we know who's making what changes where, what's being added and what's being removed. So if you use a commercial Git hosting provider like GitHub or Bitbucket or I think there's GitLab as well to, to name some of the popular ones, this is nothing new to you. That metadata or the use of that metadata is in full effect with familiar visualizations like these. But if you stop here, you'd be issuing a great deal more of information to be gained from that data. While this tells you who's making changes, when and where, it does not shed light on how that behavior is actually making your code better or worse. Which brings us back to technical debt. <clears throat> technical debt is, is a terminology that is often sort of misunderstood. It carries this unease. Right? You hear technical debt, you're thinking, oh man, the last project I worked on had so much technical debt, we just couldn't move fast enough. Right? But I think that's misguided. Because you see, in the real world, where most of us have to incur financial debt, right? be it to get a college education, buy a car, get a house, we fully understand that we are borrowing from the future in order to get some form of benefit in the present. We accept that. And we also fully understand that if we don't pay down that debt, well, this can create for some uncomfortable situations. <laughs> so then, that is a fundamental part of doing business, right? To put it colloquially, you gotta spend money to make money. Companies understand this, and they use debt strategically as a tool to make smart investments in one part of the business and not in others. So when we, an in industry, created the term technical debt back in 1992, we not only established a means of communicating the trade-offs that we were making in the software that we were shipping. But we also implicitly made a promise to use technical debt strategically as a tool, just like business does with real debt. That is why knowing simply who's making what changes where in your code base holds little strategic value in actually helping you make smart time investments in one part of your code base and not in others. Which brings us to tooling. Research into software quality has seen a big uptick, especially in academia in recent years. But I wanna reach back to 2007 to an influential project 
by one Richard Wetzel. If the name doesn't sound familiar, perhaps his research project will look familiar. Code City is able to take in your code base's commit history, or rather, the, the, the information in terms of package structure, class files, and lines of code, to create a city landscape to sort of allow you to visualize where in your code base some of the larger or smaller modules are. It uses the concept of a district to represent packages in your code and buildings within those districts to actually represent class files with the height and color of the building representing lines of code. The idea being that the taller and more colorful the building, the higher the concentration of lines of code and implicitly the higher the concentration of functionality. While a step in the right direction, it still falls short of telling us whether those areas of high concentration of functionality are strategically worth investing in. Now, before I introduce you to an evolution of this idea, let me tell you a story. Story time. <laughs> Years ago, I worked on a very large and complicated project. Don't we all at some point, right? Though, the project was a business success. By good engineering standards, it sort of struggled. It made more of a, most of us feel like this. I'm sorry, it's a bit morbid. <laughs> so we labeled it, it was an old code base, so we labeled it legacy code. And didn't want to touch parts of it with a 10-foot pole because those who had originally authored, authored some, of those, some of the arcane parts of the software had long since moved on from the company. And frankly, nobody wanted to become experts in any of those arcane parts. You don't know what they do. You don't want to go near them. You don't want to touch them. You don't want to be the guy holding the bag or the girl who has to stay up late fixing them. But even though they were old and arcane and not pretty to look at, from an engineering standpoint, they did their job. The business relied on them. They were making money. In a sense, some of those arcade bits of code were more valuable than some of us on the engineering team. They made money. Business cared about them. But not wanting to touch any of these parts of the code base, we just let sleeping dogs lie, as they say. Fast forward a few months, after enough complaining to the higher ups, we get the go ahead to start fixing some of our technical debt. So we bring in a tool like this one. Some of you might, this might look familiar to some of you, but it doesn't matter what the name of the product is, there are others like it. But the idea of around tools like this is that they will look at your code base identify the different class files or modules, grade them on some scale, 1 to 5 or A to F, and give you some pretty visualizations around what they think is quality code versus not quality code. So when we brought this in, a predictable behavior pattern started to emerge. Junior and senior developers alike started treating this as a game. And you kind of know where this is going. They started changing the arcane bits of code that had worked for months and years so that they could boost the scores of those arcane bits of code and the visualiz visualizations like these. And nobody ever stopped to ask, well, do we need to touch these? I know they have an F, right? But do we actually need to change them? They've been working fine for years. But no, we fell into a trap. We started using tools like these as the destination and not the guideposts 
on the way to a high quality code base. So there's nothing inherently wrong with using tools like these. I encourage them even with my own teams. They're fine. As you're coding, they might be even be integrated into your editor. They might be giving you active feedback. Hey, you're not doing this the idiomatic way, or you know, you're, you're creating a problem here that you don't realize you, 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 you have, or you're not checking your error values. Always check your error values. There's nothing inherently wrong with these tools. But you have to put your focus on shipping working code, and sometimes, more importantly, not breaking existing working code. So in a sense, we in the Go community are not immune to things like this. We too are susceptible to this narrow focus on grades and ratings, where the highest grades give us a confidence that our code is of high quality, when in fact, what we have is code that conforms to idioms and analysis of the day. Again, not a bad thing, but not the end goal. At last count, we had 25 lenters in the Go community. There will be more, probably, by the end of this talk. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with them. Some of them from the Go standard library. Most of them by well-meaning community members. And I, and I use many of these. It's integrated to my IDE, my VIM. It's, it's, I run, I save, it immediately gives me feedback. I love them. We even go so far as to list the projects, the top projects and libraries and packages that score well on these lenders. Again, Nothing wrong with this. But if that's all you look at to measure code quality, you're missing the point. So how do we augment our approach? How do we look at this differently? Well, we have been thinking of some innovative ways to understand the risk of change in our code. Not just through simple metrics like what I've shown, but by also looking at other fields, other fields of study, to determine if some of their techniques might be applicable to our industry. Roughly three years ago, Adam Thornhill introduced the idea of treating your code as a crime scene, in which he makes the case for using forensic psychology techniques like geographical offender profiling, to identify hotspots in your code, where a hotspot is defined as complex code that experiences a high frequency of change. Using some, some, of, some of the tools that emerged from his research, I wanted to try it out. I went and picked the most popular project I could think of other than Docker, was it Moby Now or Captain Ahab, Ahab I don't know. I found Kubernetes and decided, you know what, I'm going to run a hotspot analysis on that code base. It produced this cluster. Don't worry if you can't read it, it's not meant to be readable, simply as a, a high level view of how it's able to cluster related, bits of related code. But what it does, in addition to clustering and showing you through the size of the dots, what it does in addition to that is actually highlight in more in stronger colors to provide emphasis of what it thinks are hotspots in the code. Again, hotspot being defined as code that experiences a high frequency of change that is complex. Now, the only problem with tools like this is that this wasn't built by and for the Google community. So you kind of take what it's providing you with a grain of salt, but still, it also provides you with a change frequency distribution. Kubernetes being a very large project, around 9,000 plus files, not all Go code, obviously. You see, you have, you have the footprint, your target area, 
for changing code is quite vast. So then, like, where do you focus your attention? This is a more focused view of that same visualization. You see, right around 200, 250 lines, or files, I should say, you, you get this, this big bump, right? Whereby on this side, the, 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 the y-axis represents the frequency change, right? The higher up you are, the, the closer you are to here, the higher the frequency of change, right? And obviously the number of files. So if I wanted to focus my attention, right, I'd want to be in that corner over there where there's the most complex code with the highest frequency of change. Another output of, of some of the, this research is a knowledge graph. Now, if you recall from my story, I mentioned that some of the people who had authored those arcane bits of code had long let, since left the company, walking out the door with the knowledge of how these arcane bits of code worked. Now, if you had something like this, whereby you have a list of your team members, this being the list of the, of the contributors on the Kubernetes project, at least in part, some of them, you'd, you'd kind of get a pretty good idea of who knows what about what in the code base. You'd know that, well, if, if dead, dead S2K, if that's the way I say that, um, I apologize to dead S2K if I've mispronounced it, but if he decides to walk away, well, you have a problem here because he's got his fingerprint on quite a bit of this area of the code. Now, if I'm a manager or a team lead, this kind of scares me a little bit. And obviously, there are much worse cases so if I'm a manager or a team lead, I don't want dead S2K walking out the door with that knowledge in his head. I want knowledge sharing. I want more people to be pairing with him, working with him, or could be a her. All right? I want that knowledge sharing to, to be pervasive so that if any one person even gets sick for a week, the team doesn't come grinding to a halt. Production doesn't come right into a halt. Lastly, an output from this tool is temporal coupling analysis. Now again, not meant to be super visible, but the idea that this is the same commit information, this is the same commit log that we're producing every day. This tool simply harnesses that to show us a different view, right, on the same data. There is nothing fundamentally new here. There's no new data to look at. But by looking at the change we're making throughout our code base, we can start to identify the temporal couplings, meaning that when you change something in this part of the code base, somehow another part of the code base also has to change. Temporal coupling. So, before I go on to the recap, I showed you a list of lenders. There will be more, we will produce more. We have a strong language in which to run static analysis tools to tell us when we're doing something right that is expected by our compiler, and when we're doing something wrong that is perhaps unexpected or that's gonna lead, lead us to trouble. So imagine if we could use the output of those tools and those to come to focus that attention right, on the complex code that changes often. That would change the focus from having a, a, a perfect code base, from having everything you know, graded A, right, to being more like, hey, we need to ship code as soon as possible. Because the business doesn't pay us to have perfect code. It pays us to have working code. So we need to ship as, as soon as possible. Where do we focus our attention? So if we use the results of these lenders, right, target our attention, this allows us to use technical debt strategically. If a part of your code base fails by some metric, but never changes and, and keep, keeps working, do you need to spend time on it? 
Not if you're using those products that tell you, hey, you need to fix this, you've got problems in there. It doesn't change, I don't care. <laughs> so, we looked at what our code base already knows about us. No surprise there, just the use of that information. There's, there's some innovation that can be had on that still. We understand why managing technical debt, or why technical debt as a whole, is not a bad thing. You just have to manage it. You have to pay it down. And you have to know when to pay it down. We looked at some tools, right? Some old, some new, and some yet to be created that can help us understand that technical debt and make good decisions. And we talked about how perhaps our community could change the focus slightly on <coughs> looking at sort of the whole code base, right? Or rather, how we use these tools, right? We can focus our attention on the things that matter the most. So what now? Well, if you're a new gopher, as many of you here are, I, I don't know what that little tail is, but I'm assuming it's a tail. <laughs> It's a <laughs> but if you are a new gopher, focus on shipping working code. You'll hear a lot about idiomatic go and what that means. Yeah, half the time you can you can you know your code will work fine, just go fump it and it'll be okay. <laughs> you, know, you don't have to bring every linter, we don't have to, certainly not all 25 into your project and try to fix all the things based on everything that's given you sometimes. They contradict each other, and sometimes there are false positives. But if you are a new gopher, focus on shipping working code, right? And then know when to come back to that. And if you've been doing this for a while, you are a more seasoned gopher. <laughs> perhaps some of these ideas resonate with you. And perhaps you yourself have, have some ideas as to how I might fix this, or rather, how we might make things better for ourselves in the future. I already know that I'm going to be using a lot of what Daniel talked about earlier to help me in my own research into this area. So, we've come to the end. I hope you've enjoyed the conference. And if any of this stuff I've talked about is of interest to you, come talk to me. Let's start a conversation. Let's see what we can come up with together. Thank you.